Hello everyone, we're back again for part two of what I believe Holy Spirit is leading me to share with all of you regarding the Hebrew year 5780. Uh, we are at five in the morning on 11-11. And a very pivotal day, very interesting day. A lot of us see 11-11, uh, the time uh, the, uh, we purchase uh, our totals when we purchase items come out to 11-11. And uh, so today, several of us are fasting on, a, a, I believe it's a pivotal day, um, and, so, and several of us that are fasting together believe that as well. And I felt like that um, the very center of this video regarding the year 5780, the Hebrew year, um, was connected to um, the number one or the number 11. So I just want to go ahead and pray and um and we'll start after we pray. And this is not a live feed. Um, this is actually going directly to YouTube. And so I won't be able to do a live feed. And But if you have any comments or questions, uh, please post them in the comment boxes below. And I will try to help you find the answer to them. I don't always have the answer, but I can help you find it. So, Father, we just thank you for this um, morning and this day, uh, this fast day and prayer day de devoted and dedicated to you. We ask that you would increase our ability to hear you, to see you, to speak your word. Um, and I ask that you would anoint my lips, that I would say just what you want me to say and not anything out of my own ability. Um, I pray that you would anoint this video, it would touch the hearts of people watching and that uh, any questions that have been in the mind of, of myself or the listeners, Lord, that you would answer uh, those questions. And I just bless your holy name and thank you for uh, what you're doing in this hour. Thank you for the 11th hour. And I bless your holy name. Amen. Okay, so uh, I, I'm doing a three-part series on video, uh, on video for the understanding of the Hebrew calendar and the Hebrew year 5780, the year that we just rolled over into and I think September 28th or 29th, a couple months ago. Um, the, the first part series, uh, the first video series, part one, was about Moses and what God has been speaking to my heart about Moses, uh, the overflow of the next 12 months of the identity of Moses, the anointing of Moses, um, a burning bush encounter, uh, a confrontation with uh, Babylon, signs and wonders, but especially, uh, I think the Lord has really want us to tap into mountains this year, to go to mountains and I just, you know, to visit Him at a mountain. Um, but more than that, to get a deeper understanding of the type of personality that Moses encompassed in order to save 660,000 people from the wrath of God for real. Um, but there are, there are people that will express uh, different characteristics of Moses. Um, for those of you who are not aware, um, some of us carry staffs um, or not carry them, but actually have them, and, and we just hold on to them for a rainy day or whenever God tells us to use them. 
Uh, that's not uncommon in my world. I see people with staffs and I've been around people who hold staffs. Um, but that doesn't make them a Moses character, or, you know, like a, an actor trying to be Moses. It's just an act of obedience or um, it's an appointed and anointed staff to carry for certain purposes. Um, but it's it still ties into carrying a staff. And I believe that in the number 1111, those ones that are lined up, one, two, three, four, are all staffs. And each staff, um, a staff, can bring very powerful shifts to certain regions and personalities and situations, um, but only by the spirit not by using it as a weapon or all that other stuff. Um, I can get into more of that later, but um, I just wanted to tie that into 1111. When I was studying the number 18, the one reminded me of a staff going before the new beginning of eight. Eight in the Hebrew means new beginning. So I still see four staffs today, all day long. <laughs> and um, Jacob prophesied um, to the tribe of Judah about how he would carry a staff and be um, uh, the tribe that would rule with a, an iron scepter. And um, Jacob had a staff, Abraham had a staff, Yeshua had a staff. Staffs were very, very common in, in Bible days and in Bible times because they lived in rock, a rocky terrain. They were always hanging out in rocks and the desert and all that. And so a staff is a good walking stick. Not only is it used, it's a good walking stick. Uh, I remember when I went to Israel, um, I had my white cane staff, my white cane stick. And I, thank God I had it because the stones in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, you can, if you don't have a staff, it, it's hard to see where the steps are, but I had people telling me that they wish they had had some kind of walking cane and brought one because it was so, it's a lot of steps, uh, and especially in the old city of Jerusalem. So, um, uh, that basically part one was about Moses, and you can get into more of that by uh, watching the video, but setting chapter, uh, Exodus chapter 19, um, 32, 33, and 34. And so um, what I did not do in the first video is I didn't give really a depth and depth um, understanding of the golden calf. And I felt like the Lord wanted me to give that kind of information to all of you. Um, there was a, a real strong um, sense in my heart about the golden calf situation that happened on the base of Mount Sinai. And I feel very strongly and sense a very heavy sense that there's this golden calf is always going to be a confrontation with our hearts this year in a way that we have not understood before um but if we're not if we don't know to look for a golden calf uh confrontation or issue we don't know that it's happening around us then it can actually create a, a great level of confusion and combustion and be very hard process to, to endure. So the golden calf basically was the calf, it was the baby of a bull. It was, it was the baby bull. And Isis was the mother of the Apes bull in Egypt. And so the Apes bull was an actual bull, wasn't it a wood, stone, you know, it was an actual bull that they bred. They bred a series of bulls. It had to be a certain height. It had to be a certain weight. It had to have all the stuff. And they would parade this bull around Egypt um, 
like once a year and the whole nation would shut down and then they would, it would be the big bull day. And Pharaoh was, was known to actually run his nation like a bull. Um, he ran it like a bull. He was a, he was a bull leader. And the Apes bull actually is pretty demonic. It, it's very um, godless. It's not, um, it's not at all holy. And uh, if the bull was parading itself around Egypt and it breathed on a child, uh, the breath of the bull was considered anointed and the child would have all this gift, uh, uh, all these giftings. And so, it, you know, they wanted the bull to breathe on the kids. I mean, it's just, it was just awful. And so, um, but what Aaron was doing is he was taking the gold uh, ornaments from the children of Israel and, and the bottom line to the golden calf, how it all began <laughs> was that the children of Israel, they got really impatient because there was delay. And they decided that they wanted a goddess to lead them into the uh, wilderness and forget about Moses and forget about God and, you know, forget about Elohim and Yahweh and Yeshua and just forget all of that because, you know, we can do it our way now. And they coerced uh, Aaron, uh, who was Moses' brother, to make this God for them. And he just jumped right in. And it, that whole story, if you ever get into it in Exodus chapter 33, uh, actually it starts in Exodus uh, 32. It reminds me of Adam and Eve. I mean, it reminds me of Adam, like, for real. And um, it's just, it's just, you know, it's like the, it's like the golden calf was the, tr the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's all the same. You know, Eve ate of the fruit and the serpent, you know, coerced her to do so. And she gave it to Adam. And it just, ah. Uh, anyway, so, um, so crazy. Um, anyway, another man, uh, it, there's no scripture that says that either man repented. And so um, we need to pray for the men this year that they would grab a hold of um, the revelation of the son of the living God and, and they would have a, a, a spirit of repentance. Anyway, so Moses, um, the, the golden calf, okay, so the golden calf was melted down gold and shafted into a calf. And that calf represented the baby of Isis. Isis is still worshipped in Egypt today. She's, it, the goddess is still heavily worshipped in Egypt. If you look on the back of a dollar bill, uh, on the left-hand side of the bill is a pyramid with an eye at the top. That is Isis. The, the all-seeing eye, the one eye, that's Isis. And so it's still, it's still all, it's all around us. You know what I'm saying? So it's just so crazy. But um, the, the gold represented the counterfeit sun, S-U-N. And Isis was the god to the, in which they worshiped the sun. She was the sun god, is the sun god. And so um, the gold caught light and it was the counterfeit to the sun. So that's why the gold was a big deal. Um, the other thing that happened was when Aaron um, erected this, this, uh, this idol, uh, a, a powerful spirit was released all through the camp and the people just went nuts. They went crazy, crazy. And um, to the point where uh, they were running mad and Moses had to give the, the sons of Levi were the only ones that did not partake of any of that. And um, he gave the sons of Levi in Exodus um, 32 each a knife and had them run through the camp and kill every 
every brother, every companion, and every neighbor. Um, and that 3,000 people were killed. Um, but, but the truth of the matter is, Pharaoh worshipped the Apes bull. He loved the Apes bull. And everybody in all in Egypt worshipped the Apes bull. And so to father, to father, the, the building of this golden calf, I cannot drive this point home enough, was an abomination because it basically was bringing Pharaoh back into the picture of what he delivered them out of. And, you know, when God delivers you of something like cigarettes or smoking or sex or whatever, and and you and we kind of just like dismiss that and then we get right back into it, it that really does hurt it hurts the heart of the father, it's true. I'm sorry, but I gotta say it, it hurts the heart of the father when we do that. And so we, we gotta be very mindful and have a lot of wisdom about what the behavior that we partake in and, and the things that we do uh, that hurts the heart of the father. You may not you may not think that the father hurts in heaven by what he sees down here, but he really he really does. He's grieved by a lot of the stuff that he sees. And he sees it all. He hears it all. Don't do not think for one second that that I won't be accountable to God for the things that I per participate in. I will be accountable to God for what I participate in. And he hears it all and he sees it all. So I'm going to get into a tag, a tag subject of this later on in, the, in this video about the issue of mercy. I'm going to get into that. Um, so when the Christians wanted a day, this is later on in history, we're talking about way after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, probably about the 12th century, um, the Christians wanted a day to worship God. Elohim, Yahweh. And um, so the emperor said, you know what? We'll give you Sunday, the day that we worship the sun, Isis. It's all connected, people. It's all connected. So uh, you go to church every Sunday. Is it true? And, um, and then you look at the issue of gold, how much it's worshipped in today's society, how much it People are buying gold all the time and all that, the obsession of gold. But on top of that, if you look at the New York Stock Exchange on Wall Street, there's a bull sitting in front of the New York Stock Exchange. It's the golden calf. It's, the, it's an adult figure of, of the golden calf, and that is the apex bull translated after general it just translated and translated <clears throat> and you know uh solomon wrote in ecclesiastes he said all the world is vanity and there's nothing new under the sun and he's he was right he was right so um we just really got to grab a hold of jealousy and and hatred and gossip and um the way that we treat each other and, and you know, uh, those all can be idols. Uh, what we worship in our minds, the thoughts, all that can be idolatrous and a golden calf that we're erecting inside of our hearts. And, and then we get delivered of it and then we go back and we get delivered and we go back and we got to get to a point where we're cross over the line and we'll say no more. And, and we just, I'll just pray that Father would help us connect to deliverance ministers that could cast out or help us deal with or give us counseling away from these things that, that grieves the heart of the Father. Because we can see in Exodus 32 what an abomination that was to the heart of the Father. To, for them to put Pharaoh back into the into the whole scenario 
it, it, I mean, he told Moses, we're undone. I'm going to burn him up. <laughs> he told Moses that. That is not a joke. <clears throat> Thank God for Moses, right? So, that, you know, there's going to be saviors this year that's going to walk in mercy and compassion like Moses did in intercession. And so the overflow of, of, of that uh, all, all year long, month after month, Father, help us. Okay, and so now we're in the next part of the, uh, the subject matter of um, this uh, particular video is the understanding of 5780. Now, I'm sorry if this is a repeat for some of you, but um, we entered into the High Holy Days in um, September 28th or 29th. And the calendar changed from 5779 to 5780 of the Hebrew calendar. Now, the, the Gregorian calendar, the Roman calendar, begins on January um, 1st. Uh, and that kicks us off into 2020. But when we move the calendar, when the calendar moves in the fall, and it kicks off the High Holy Days in the fall, um, it's the forerunner. It foreruns before January. So a lot of us enter into warfare in those fall months, September, October, November, December, and we don't know why we're in such high level warfare because we've already entered into the year and we're forerunning for January. And so uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah, uh, is the uh, Jewish New Year, but it's really it's really the festival of Yahweh mentioned in the Book of Leviticus given to Moses. They weren't Jews at the time; they just come out of Egypt. So our disassociation with the festivals of the Hebrew calendar, because we believe that they're just for this people group, is completely not even biblical. Um, we all have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy in our Bibles. And so, and all of those five books have been given to everyone on the planet that has a Bible. So those festivals are in there for all of us. And there's a reason why that they're in there. So uh, Rosh Hashanah kicks off the High Holy Days. And then for 10 days, it's uh, at the Days of Awe. And then after the days of Ah, it's Yom Kippur. And then that's the Day of Atonement. And then seven days later, it's Tabernacles or Sukkot, however you want to say it. And so when it switched over to 5780, I heard and saw in my spirit Psalm 80 everywhere. I was like, Psalm 80? What is all that about? I had no idea. I had no idea what Psalm 80 was about. So I started studying Psalm 80. I've been studying it now for two months. And I'm so blown by what the Lord has shown me about the vineyard. And that is um, what I'm going to get into now. But before we go into the vineyard, I'm going to bring uh, a very interesting revelation about Psalm 80. It's... Um, grouped together with the Psalms of destruction um, and devastation. So there was a lot of uh, hardship that was going on during when the Psalms were written. And basically, uh, Israel was just constantly at war and David was in the center of all of it. Um, so if you just turn with me now to Psalm 80, we're going to get this, this word on the roll. <laughs> we're going to get this word on the scroll. Um, in Psalm 80, verse 1, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, there's an interesting parallel going on here. Now, and for those of you who do not know, Psalm 8, um, this, the book of Psalms, okay, is songs, S-O-N-G-S. Some psalms that are songs are not as popular in, at the, in biblical days as some 
songs were. In other words, um, some of their worship songs like Amazing Grace is common and a lot of people know it and they know the verses of it and all that. Well, some of the Psalms were the same way. Um, actually, a very popular deliverance Psalm was Psalm 91. And for those of you who do not know, uh, this is very interesting information. David, when he would play the harp for King Saul, and King Saul would call him in to play the harp, David would play the harp and sing Psalm 91, and devils would come out of King Saul. And when devils were leaving King Saul, he, they would try to kill David. <laughs> he was playing the harp. I mean, like, wow. It's crazy. But that tells you how, how awesome that psalm is. Psalm 91, man, you want to get delivered. Woo! It's pretty amazing. Okay, so here, O Shepherd of Israel. This is a very popular song uh, during those days. And uh, that this song is the song of the lilies, an As a song of Asaph. And it says, Here, O Shepherd of Israel. You who lean Joseph like a flock, shine, oh, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine for it. And so just the first verse is pretty loaded. Uh, it's pretty amazing, actually, because it's talking about the shepherd of Israel, and we all know who that is, and his name is King Yahshua. And this same shepherd theme is used in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He made me like down in green pastures. It's all the same theme. But it's but it's interesting that Psalm 80 is the center psalm of the book of Psalms. And Psalm 119 is the center psalm in the whole Bible. I found that extremely interesting. And it the, the name of Joseph is mentioned more times in this area of the Bible, Psalm uh, 79, 80, and 81, than any other portion of the Bible other than Genesis. And so the, the writer saying, Hear, give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph. Oh, hold on a second, because the psalm thought, David was, you know, hanging out. Not Joseph, but no, the writer writes about Joseph. You who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine for it. And so I want to share with you that um, there's a flock and a shepherd issue and this is mentioned in John chapter 10 when Yeshua says uh, the shepherd uh, are, are, are the head of the sheep and the sheep know his voice and they follow. Um, but Joseph is being tight, uh, tied to as if he was a shepherd and he was not a shepherd. He was not. You who dwell between the cherubim and the cherubim is the area, it's the angel that's mentioned on uh, the Ark of the Covenant. There were two angels that were shafted and created to sit on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And their wings would overshadow a, a wooden space in the center. And that was the mercy seat where the... the um, the high priest would come in once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, like we were just talking about, and they would sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the mercy seat to atone for all of the sin of the children of Israel. And so any time that you're reading the word and you hear, you read the word cherubim or hear it from somebody else, it means mercy. And so there's a mercy rain that God wants to put over our hearts this year. I mean, he really wants to, 
he really wants to, uh, to rain down his mercy, but he's grieved. Because it's like he's grieving, and the only way that he can handle the grief is to rain down mercy in the midst of our situation. But if you if you listen to the video in part one, there's a glory realm that God wants to encounter in our hearts this year regarding the cherubim, regarding the mercy seat, regarding the most holy place, the encounter of his glory. Uh, and, and here we see it again in Psalm 80, where the Lord is really trying to give us a revelation of the shepherd where he can lead Israel, a whole nation of people, where he can lead you, where he can lead me. Um, as, as Joseph uh, leads his flock, um, there are, uh, this, verse 2 talks about um, leading Manasseh, uh, Ephraim, and Benjamin. Um, I'm not going to get into all of that because it, it really is getting into the tribal sequence and it's just not enough time for all that. But I will say that God wants to bring order to our families and to our the, the, the blessing of the firstborn, especially those that are the firstborn or those that are the youngest. Uh, when Jacob and um, when Jacob was uh, blessing Joseph's uh, sons and Genesis 48 he crossed his arms like a cross and he put his right hand on Ephraim's head which was like no 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 don't do that because he was giving Ephraim the firstborn blessing and all of the nations and multiple of nations have have increased since that promise that was given to Abraham was basically released onto Ephraim. It wasn't given to, to Manasseh. It wasn't given to Joseph. So a lot of the multi races and tribes all across the earth uh, are probably the product of the tribe of Ephraim, that firstborn blessing that was given. So there's an order that the father wants to release uh, over our families this year, over our tribes, over who we're hanging out with. Uh, he really wants to deal with the issue of chaos. Uh, also, and I forgot to mention that when it, the Hebrew year turned to 5780, in the 70s uh, decade, 5770, 5771-7273, that uh, was the I-N symbol, which represented the I, and, um, but the symbol has now changed uh, to an eight, and that eight is the Chi symbol, which represents the mouth. Um, the eight is the, is the number of new beginnings. It's also on its side, a pair of eyes, and it's also two rings interlocked and broken. And so we're going to be in a sequence of new beginnings. Sometimes it's not going to be good new beginnings, but um, that's what that eight is identifying. And there's a mouth and a, and a voice of the Lord that's going to go forth over the waters as it, as it was mentioned in Exodus chapter 19 when the mountain shook and the whole mountain was on fire and the thundering and lightning. There's an issue where God wants to bring his voice into our reality um, and we're going to have to we have to be um, tenacious and, and, and disciplined to shut out other voices. Um, I don't know like you have to discern that i mean from one um situation to another but uh, not every voice is of the lord you can you know the voice of the lord and the prophetic when it confirms or it confirms what's in the word or it confirms what you've already known in your heart um so the lord needs to give us discernment you know as well as 
um, hearing his voice or speaking what he's saying. A lot of teachers are going to rise up, rise up this year. A lot of people who've never taught before are going to start teaching. Um, and some people are going to be teaching not biblical subjects. They're going to be just teaching, you know. Some people just need training at their job or they need training on how to ride a bicycle. You know, the Lord's really going to release or how to use it, technology, you know. Um, what, and then the, the last portion of this verse, it says, shine forth and shine, uh, the shiny face gospel. <laughs> um, that's mentioned four times and this, um, in this psalm, it's taken from Numbers uh, 6.24, May the Lord bless you, keep you, may his face shine upon you. Uh, that's the Aaronic blessing that, that Aaron would say over the children of Israel every day. Um, if you have uh, lift up uh, his countenance upon you and give you peace, you want to find a translation that, t that gives the shine his face upon you identification, the wording of it. Because it, it really, when, you're, when God is shining on you like a spotlight, you're done. I mean, it, the favor's there, and you don't have, there's no more striving, you know? And it's not a manufactured spotlight from Broadway plays and, and, and movies and stuff. I'm talking about when that beautiful light of the glory of God shines upon you, and it's his face shining upon you, it's unmistakable, you know? It, it's, it's, un, it's, it's, it's not... Uh, it's not um, confusing to another light force. Um, and God wants to shine his light force on us this year for real. Um, in this psalm, there's a lot of things going on with the issue of rest restoring and reviving. The name of the Lord, Lord God, Lord God of hosts, is Adonai Elohim Sabaoth. Um, but it's used in several different identities in this psalm. It's mentioned as Elohim. It's mentioned as Elohim Sabaoth. It's mentioned as Adonai Elohim Sabaoth. It, it's like the writer is very desperate. And, we, and we're going to know why. The writer is very desperate for the Lord to shine upon them and revive them and restore them because... Their vineyard is getting eaten alive. And that's true. If the vineyard has gotten eaten alive. If you're talking about the nation of Israel and you hear and you read the word she in the scripture, she is referring to the bride, which is Israel. Um, and verse four, it says, there is, um, there is a cry and, uh, yeah, there is a cry in the psalm, okay, and there's a cry of restoration. There's a cry of, um, there's a cry of revival. And in verse 4, which I'm trying to find right now, let me look at this real quick. It says, um, in verse 4, it says, here it says, O Lord God of hosts. So that would be, O Adonai Elohim Sabaoth. Um, and host, the Lord God of hosts, the God of hosts is the essence, the God of the army, the God, the God of war, the God of um, violence. Uh, and our Father is, He has been violent and He is violent. Um, against injustice, again, and uh, in judgment. It says, O oh Lord God of hosts, um, how long will you be against the prayers of your people? So the writer is saying, we're praying and you're against us. And so we got to find a new way to pray this year that really that really works in our favor, that really uh, allows his face to shine upon us, to restore us, to revive us. 
And, you know, a lot of us are running to revival, you know, meetings and all that, and they're crying out for fire and the revival. I do that too, so I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But I think this year the Lord wants to encounter us individually. And and when once we go into this individual encounter, then it'll happen corporately. I think I think we're running to the corporate meeting without dealing with the intimate one-on-one meeting with Father, the, the tent of meeting with Father, with with Elohim, with with Lord Sabaoth. Um, okay, and so here we have the problem, and this is the very center of this video. It's the problem of the vineyard. It's been it's been the hedges have been torn down. It says here that a boar actually goes and takes a boar in the woods actually takes over the vineyard that Father himself has planted. It says here it says you have brought you have brought a vine out of Egypt. The father did that. He brought Yeshua out of Egypt. He brought a whole nation of people out of Egypt. And his, his, his vine is his people. It's his nations. And it says, you have cast out the nations because he cast out the nations and he brought the vine to the nation, Israel, that he wanted to plant them there. And it says, and planted, and planted it. So the father himself, he cast all the people out of a, a land space that he didn't want there. He took a vine out of Egypt and he planted it himself. And if you read in Genesis um, chapter 2, verse 5, he took Adam and planted a garden of Eden and put Adam in the garden. It's the same identification. It's the same thing. And if you look at the issue of Aaron and Adam, Aaron with the golden calf and Adam, both men did not repent. And both of them were in idolatry. It's it's instant times. And we need to pray for the men this year that they would have a, a spirit of repentance and that they would be good leaders. Men. I'm talking about men. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. And then it says, um, so then it begins to describe this vine that um, that the father planted. It says you prepared the rim for it, you know, and caused it to take deep root, deep root, not not on sand. Um, but the cry of the writer it says. Um, it says here in verse 11, it says, she sent out her bows to the sea and the sea is the Mediterranean Sea and she represents Israel and her branches to the river and the river is referring to the Euphrates, which is by Iraq or Iran. Um, so you have all of that land space that father cleared out, put a people there, planted the vine, put, put it in deep roots, and then all of a sudden a boar shows up and a beast of the field and it starts to break down the hedges. And the, and the nations come by and they just pick what they want and it's just ransacked. So the writer says in verse 13, why have you broken down her hedges? Why, 
are you allowing this to take place? And um, and so then the more the more of the identification of the vineyard. Um, I want to skip down to. And then it says in verse, uh, I believe this is verse 16, 15, it says, and the vineyard which you, which your right hand has planted and the branch that you made strong for yourself. It is burned with fire. I mean, we really got to get a wall of security around our hearts and our vineyard. And, and this, a vineyard doesn't have to be um, a physical thing. A vineyard can be... Um, it can be a job, it can be a relationship, it can be your walk with the Lord, it can be um, provision, your, your savings account. Um, it can be your children, right? Um, but there's this issue of, it's, all I've been seeing for the last couple of days is a cluster of grapes. And, and there's this new wine that God wants to release in this generation. And he does save the best for last. But I think he really wants to give us instruction first on what to do with this cluster of grapes. And I'm talking figuratively. It could be a cluster of grapes and you might have a vineyard in your backyard. But I, I'm really not talking about a natural thing. I'm talking about a precious commodity that we sometimes just ransack and give it away and we don't care take over what Father has given us, even if it's our mind, even if it's um, uh, even if it's uh, our hearts, uh, a boundary, um, you know, when you have an ocean and you have sand like the Mediterranean Sea, or I live in Houston, so we have a gap, we have a beach. Um, when when the sand is done and the water begins, that's a boundary that nobody can uh, reestablish. Uh, they can't just move the whole ocean. Is my point and you know, and leave it to somebody's backyard. Um, sometimes we have to be very still about the boundary that, that the Father has set in place. Um, and that really is the vineyard. And then the bottom line here is verse 17, and then I'll end it. It says, um, it says, let, let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man, whom you made strong for yourself. Now, when this verse, when this chapter began in verse one, it is, Hear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherubim shine forth. But here it's not, it's saying the hand uh, upon the man of your right hand, the son of man that you have made strong. And so when I went into the understanding of this verse, it took me right to King David. It wasn't talking about Joseph. And it's interesting because Joseph was not a shepherd. He was not a shepherd. He didn't have sheep. He didn't do all that stuff. He was in Pharaoh's house and he or in prison. He didn't do all that stuff. Um, so I found this interesting that the end of this psalm is not talking about Joseph after all, 
is talking about David. But I think what the Lord wants to do is he wants to tie all these uh, concepts together to give us a bigger picture. He wants to be the shepherd over the flock. He wants us to know that we can have the provision of the vineyard like Joseph, like Noah had a vineyard, right? Didn't he make a vineyard, but he didn't watch over it and his son violated him in uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 20. Didn't the gentleman in 2 Kings chapter 21, didn't he have a vineyard and Ahab wanted the vineyard and Jezebel killed him and bought the vineyard? And there's something about just shelter and security. Um, You know, there could be something security uh, and, and the issue of our nation, you know, maybe our nation is a vineyard. Maybe the Lord wants us to, to keep watch over our nation. It, it is very, quite possible. Uh, maybe it's your city. Maybe it's your ministry. Maybe it's your church. Um, I don't know. But, but where we keep watch um, as the shepherd leads us into that new Uh, identity, where we keep watch is have the heart of David and worship. And um, David was able to, he knew who he was in God. I mean, he used one smooth stone and then killed Goliath. And so there's this issue of of being a warrior for your vineyard, that you're going to war for that vineyard. You're going to hold on to it and secure it because the shepherd has led you to it. Um, And then I'll lead you out of it. And then you'll take your vineyard with you and go to the next assignment um, or into the new place with your vineyard, not left behind in, you know, two below Mississippi somewhere. Anyway, so that is all I wanted to share. And um, I do want to say also that Psalm 119, verse 88, is the center of the whole Bible. And it's very similar to Psalm 80, and it's 88. Uh, That verse is the center of the entire Bible. And it says, to revive, um, revive me with your loving kindness and restore me to me the testimony of your mouth. And so there we have that mouth again in the center of the whole Bible. So, Father, I just pray right now, God, that she would uh, cater to our ability uh, of misunderstanding, where we don't understand, help us to understand. Help us to walk in other people's shoes for like a day and have more compassion for other people. Um, But help us to keep a wall around our vineyard, not wall people out intentionally, but to be secure in our own identity, to be secure um, in the understanding of, of who you've called us to be. Help us to be more wise about the provision that you give us, that we don't just squander it that we don't uh, just neglect it and just leave it in the corner of a room Um, and help us to cultivate this relationship with you like Moses was able to do on Mount Sinai where we're able to you know see the 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 staffs set up like like ones one two three four and we can just grab a hold of that staff and knowing that um, that staff of justice is going to lead us into um, into that um, the staff of justice is going to lead us into um, a better foundation that's not cracked, um, and and we'll have others with us in the midst of what's happening or behind us. We just pray for leaders right now. Um, 11 in the Hebrew means straight, narrow, to move forward, uh, to be a leader. 
to be in alignment. Uh, it's also a vertical number. Um, 11, uh, after the number 10, is actually chaos. If you're in the sequence of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, when it falls after 10, it represents chaos and judgment and confusion. So we don't want that to, to wipe out our vineyard. We don't, we don't want that to take away our Moses staff or our anointing to have an encounter at a burning bush or a mountain. So, Father, we just thank you for this night. We thank you for this day. And I just ask that you would continue to speak to us, give us more ears to hear, eyes to see, heal our hearts of where we've been traumatized and hurt and wounded and uh, judgments have been made about us uh, incorrectly. Um, help us to not talk about each other and be jealous, slander one another. God, give us uh, pure hearts before you. I'm accountable to God for everything that I do and say. I'm accountable to God. And and He's He hears it all and He sees it all. And I just ask that that fear of the Lord would come over me. Uh, Lord, when I'm dipping into an area I don't need to be in, um, just put a guard over my mouth and, and help the body of Christ to come together um, and let's work this vineyard together. Let's not work it um, individually. Let's, let's, let's try working a vineyard uh, um, together to meet the same goal. Let's try that type of vineyard. And we just thank you, Father, for this night and this morning. And I just bless your name. And may you all have a wonderful day. And thank you for taking the time. And God bless you. And I will see you on the third video about the Hebrew calendar. Shalom.